You're watching Tag TV. You're watching Tag TV. Welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pulwama attack key conspirator aid killed in Jammu and Kashmir encounter. Canadian Pashtuns hold anti-Pakistan protests for sponsoring Taliban. And Taliban violence escalates as fight for key cities intensifies in Afghanistan. While Pakistan is trying hard to revive terrorism in Kashmir, India is committed to fighting all their tricks to stop its western neighbor from inciting terror in the valley. The Indian security forces, despite suffering losses, managed to foil all its devious agendas. Once again, continuing with the spate of encounters that have taken place recently in the valley, Indian security forces eliminated at least five terrorists in Pulwama and Bandipura districts of Kashmir. The man in this picture is Muhammad Ismail Elias Lambu, the nephew of Jashi Muhammad chief Maulana Masood Azhar and a key conspirator in Pulwama attack which had claimed the lives of 40 CRPF personnel in 2019. In a major success, Indian security forces recently neutralized Mohammed Ismail, including one other terrorist, during an encounter in Kashmir. An IED expert, Ismail was currently the main Jash Mohammed commander in Kashmir. According to the intelligence agencies, he had infiltrated into India in January 2017 from Pakistan and was carrying terrorist activities in several areas of the valley. Not only Mohammed Ismail wanted to carry out Fidain attack on establishments of Indian police and security forces, but he was also motivating the local youth for stone pelting and other unlawful activities to disturb peace in the area. The army police military सर्च ऑपरेशन शुरू किया आज मॉर्निंग में फायरिंग शुरू हो गया जिसमें जेस के दो टेररिस्ट मारे गए उसमें एक टॉप मोस्ट वांटेड टेररिस्ट जो है जिसको लंबू भाई बोलते हैं अदनान भी बोलते हैं शेफुल्ला ही बोलते हैं असली हम उसका इस्माइल मौलवी है जो लेथपुरा अटैक 2019 में इन्वॉल्व था लेटर थ्री मोर one of them was identified as Shakir Altab Bhatt of Bandepura. His killing and subsequent finding that he had left the country on a valid passport for studies in Pakistan in 2018 and returned as a terrorist has set alarm bells ringing in the security establishment in Jammu and Kashmir. As per government officials, there has been an increase in the number of youth who had traveled to Pakistan or Bangladesh for studies and had infiltrated back into the country as trained terrorists. This is in addition to over 100 Kashmiri youths who travel to Pakistan on valid visas for short durations and have either not come back or disappeared after their return in the last three years. This racket has been run by Hurriyat Conference and they would charge money and they would get money from Pakistan also. These students who are going to study abroad, especially in Pakistan and Bangladesh, the government of India should first of all scrutinize all their associates, their parents and also their social media accounts so that these students who would get radicalized or who have a tendency to get radicalized would not be issued the visa. Pakistan as we know will leave no stone unturned to radicalize anyone from India who goes there. Therefore, the government of India should just ban Pakistan as a country for travel for students. Thirdly, that these students 
before they go and after they come back there should be a strict check on them meanwhile pakistan and its intelligence agency isi have started setting up new terror control rooms in pak occupied kashmir and are also building synergy among terror groups to launch attacks on jammu and kashmir ahead of india's independence day according to intelligence inputs a series of meetings have taken place between senior functionaries of banned terrorist organizations including Lashkar-e-Taiba, Jaish-e-Mohammed and Al-Badr in POK. Pak's ISI and terrorist groups are planning to infiltrate into Jammu and Kashmir through eight new routes via LOC that have been identified by the security agencies. Terror launch pads in POK have been reinforced with terrorists and about 146 terrorists have been placed at various launch pads since June this year. Moreover, Pakistan's ISI is now resorting to use of drones to infiltrate weapons and drugs to fuel narco-terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. After the drone blast at Jammu Air Force Station in June, the number of drone sightings has gone up drastically as several drones have been spotted near the international border in Kashmir in recent days. Pakistan has been at its best of trying to infiltrate people physically and if not physically then trying to send in drones equipped with narcotics and arms and ammunition. This sort of a thing has been going on since long and now after declaring ceasefire in the Jammu Kashmir sector they are now trying to get in people to infiltrate from the international border in Punjab. Pakistan will not mend its ways. It is only we, the Indian government and the Indian people, that we have to decide now how to deal with Pakistan because it seems that diplomatic and other pressures are not going to work on Pakistan, but punitive action will work. While the situation in Jammu and Kashmir is returning to normalcy, Pakistan has intensified its efforts at increasing the strength of terrorists in launch pads along the line of control to create havoc in the region. Such consistent attempts of Pakistan at fomenting trouble and breaching harmony in an otherwise peaceful Kashmir reek of its duplicity. Over the past few decades, the Afghan people have been the victim of continuous proxy war of Pakistan, a country that has played a sinister role in keeping the war ablaze. An unholy coalition of the Pakistani state, narco mafia and other terrorist groups has caused unimaginable death and destruction in Afghanistan. The overwhelming majority of Afghans are now calling on Pakistan to stop supporting proxy groups that kill and destroy for the petty interests of Pakistani military. A report. With each passing day, the situation in Afghanistan is worsening. The Taliban have captured most of the rural parts of the country and the security forces are concentrating their efforts to stop them from entering urban centers. In such a vulnerable moment, neighboring Pakistan is testing the waters and is trying to take advantage. Therefore, Afghan nationals and residents living in different countries are asking the world to turn its eyes on Pakistan's double game in war-torn country. They are blaming Pakistan's strategic debt policy for unbearable suffering of Afghans along both sides of the Durand line. Recently, Canadian Pashtun staged protests in Toronto against Pakistan's proxy war in Afghanistan and highlighted the South Asian country's support to the Taliban in ongoing Afghan conflict. This is a proxy war. Afghanistan has been in a proxy war for the last 40 years. The only person behind all of this is Pakistan. Pakistan is funding their Taliban. They are waiting at the border to cross Afghanistan. It is not just a war for Afghanistan, it's a proxy war. It is, we have lost millions of lives. People are dying every day and nobody is here right now to help us. Nobody, unless we unite each other, and we stand in solidarity against Pakistan and against the United States of America who has left us. We have had no help since the war that has began 40 years ago. 
you still believe that it is Afghanistan Talibs, if you still think that, why can't you understand that it's Imran Khan? He's the one who's been funding the Taliban for the last 20, 40 years. He's the one who has killed us. It's a proxy war. The majority of Afghans believe that since the days of the Afghan resistance against the Soviet invasion in the 1980s, Pakistan has been playing a ruthless game of manipulation with both the Afghans and their largest sponsor, the United States. Their belief is strongly supported by many strategic experts and leaders around the world. For instance, recently former Canadian politician and diplomat Chris Alexander also accused Pakistan of engaging in an act of aggression against neighboring Afghanistan. We call upon the international community, the United Nations and other international organizations to impose strong political, economic and military sanctions on Pakistan for creating, harboring and sponsoring terrorism through haunting Afghanistan, the region and the world. We appeal to the United Nations to play a strong and effective intermediary role in urging Pakistan, the Taliban, and other players involved in this conflict for an immediate, unconditional, and comprehensive ceasefire in Afghanistan. Afghan officials have long maintained that Pakistan provides shelter and military support to the Taliban. Recently, Pakistan's Interior Minister Sheikh Rashid Ahmad stated that families of Afghan Taliban reside in his country, including in the capital city of Islamabad. He also admitted that the Taliban receive medical treatment in Pakistani hospitals. Therefore, many experts in Afghanistan believe that the Taliban would not engage in a meaningful dialogue with Ashraf Ghani government as long as the Pakistani military and intelligence continue to give sanctuary to terrorists. Afghans believe that if Pakistan really wants to show its sincerity, it needs to immediately force the Taliban leaders to either compromise or leave their sanctuaries in Pakistan. Taliban have sanctuaries across the border where they run, hide, recruit and come back. Until, unless the war put proper uh, pressure on those who sponsor terrorism and stop Taliban, close their sanctuaries, their, their Islamic madrasas, we will not see peace in Afghanistan. There will be no peace in Afghanistan unless and until Pakistan stops its covert proxy war in the war-torn nation. What Pakistan is doing is a threat to international peace and security and hence concerted international action is needed to stop its terror game. Meanwhile, Taliban has gained significant territory in the weeks following the announcement of a full withdrawal of US and NATO troops from Afghanistan. The war-torn country is witnessing a surge in violence and the Taliban's aggressive advances have not left even the renowned persons in society. The recent car bomb blast in Kabul, claimed by the Taliban, targeted the acting defense minister's home and left several civilians dead. We have a report. Insecurity has been growing in Afghanistan as Taliban insurgents have launched major offensives taking several districts and targeting renowned personalities in the country. Recently, a car bomb struck downtown Kabul, followed by a sporadic exchange of gunfire near the residence of Afghanistan's acting defense minister, Bismillah Khan Muhammadi. The attack targeted a guest house that belonged to the politician, but fortunately, he was not there when the explosion happened. But the explosion near the heavily fortified green zone area killed at least three civilians. Taliban spokesperson Zabihullah Mujahid accepted that the group targeted the minister's residence, adding that an important meeting was underway at the time. نرسیده است ولی متاسفانه چند تن از محافظین من جراحت برداشتند من به همه شما هموطنان عزیز و گرامی اطمینان می دهم که این حوادث بر روحیه و عزم ما برای دفاع از شما و سرزمین من کوچکترین خلل ایجاد نخواهد کرد 
The attack represents a fall in the country's security situation and a sign that the capital is at the risk of violence as the insurgents take control of swathes of territory. The fundamentalist Islamist militia is already thought to have captured up to half of all Afghanistan's territory, including lucrative border crossings with Iran and Pakistan. Experts and diplomats across the world have acknowledged that the Taliban feel emboldened by their recent military gains in the country. Moreover, intelligence reports are suggesting that the current government in Kabul could collapse within six months after the American withdrawal. In such a critical situation, the United States also admitted that one of many concerns about Afghanistan is that it could spiral into civil war. They have acknowledged that the Taliban stepped up violence had shaken confidence in such assumptions. Well, there's one party that is, uh, in most cases, uh, responsible for the uh, outrageous and atrocious acts of violence uh, that have been perpetrated uh, against the Afghan people, and uh, that's the Taliban. Uh, of course, uh, other um, terrorist groups, ISIS-K, uh, also active, um, but uh, we have seen uh, an increase in these ongoing Taliban attacks. They show little regard for human life, um, for the rights uh, of the Afghan people, including the basic right of the Afghan people to live in safety and security. The targeted killings, the destructions of buildings, of bridges, other vital infrastructure, other violent acts against the people of Afghanistan, uh, we recognize they are in stark contravention to statements from the Taliban leadership. We've seen from the loss of innocent Afghan life and the displacement of Afghans, the civilian pop population, uh, the people, it is the people of Afghanistan who suffer the most and who bear the brunt uh, of these horrific attacks. The last 20 years saw a renaissance in the Afghan media landscape, but now it's crumbling. Access to information which is a right of the people, is taken from them. A large number of media outlets have also fallen to the Taliban and are being used as a voice for their activities. Taliban forces are deliberately targeting journalists and other media workers. Afghan President Ashraf Ghani also believes that Taliban will not engage in meaningful negotiations unless the situation changes on the battlefield. زموږ د اوسني وضعیت لامل دا و چې تصمیم ناڅاپه یو نیول شو ما د امریکا جمهور رئیس ته وویل چې پرېکړه ته یې درناوی لرم ځکه د هغوی فیصله وه خو زه پوهېدم چې دا پرېکړه ځینې پایلې لري او د خطرونو مدیریت به د افغانانو په غاړه واچول سي While U.S. negotiators have been pressing the Taliban to agree to peace talks with the Kabul government and to a ceasefire, it seems that that would not happen. For the Taliban, peace doesn't mean an end to the fighting. It means an end to the U.S. occupation, and for that, it can go to any extent. Several news reports and social media claims have highlighted the worrisome dimension of strengthening of Taliban's relations with Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, and even with the members of Turkistan Islamic Movement. Moving on, India recently assumed the rotating presidency of United Nations Security Council and will be hosting signature events including maritime security, peacekeeping and counter-terrorism in the month of August. India began a new journey at the United Nations Security Council this year as it became its non-permanent member for the eighth time. Ever since, New Delhi, which has not only been at the forefront of fighting terrorism, especially cross-border terrorism, but has also been one of its biggest victims, has been raising the issue of international terrorism and its sponsors at the Council, a report. India has been a constant victim of terrorism. However, with its revised counter-terrorism strategies, the country has not only managed to defeat this menace at home, but is also leading the collective fight against this global threat, along with the world's powerful economies like the United States. 
Going on the same routes, India recently assumed the rotating presidency of United Nations Security Council and will be hosting signature events. As part of its new role as president of the UNSC, India will decide the agenda of the United Nations' highest decision-making body, whose resolutions and directives are binding on all member states. India will also coordinate important meetings on a range of issues during August, counter-terrorism being the most significant agenda. We are firmly against terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. We have never failed to highlight the manifestations of terrorist activities across the world. India has consistently kept the spotlight on combating terrorism, both inside uh, the discussions in the Council and outside as well. We have not only strengthened the efforts to combat terrorism, especially, for example, in financing of terrorism, but we have also prevented efforts to dilute the focus on terrorism. India's permanent representative to the UN, T.S. Tirumurti, also raised deep concerns over the worsening situation of Afghanistan and said that we cannot have terrorist camps once again going back into the war-torn country. Tirumurti cited a UN report that said the number of casualties in Afghanistan during May-June exceeds the number between January and April, proving that violence is increasing in the nation. In the backdrop of intensifying conflicts in Afghanistan, Tirumurti's comments come when asked about how India plans to take the lead highlighting the situation in Afghanistan and will India initiate a discussion on Pakistan for supporting the Taliban. So the members of the Security Council are naturally deeply concerned at the turn of events. Um, India has always maintained that we would like to see an independent, peaceful, democratic, stable and a prosperous Afghanistan. And we have been calling for immediate cessation of violence. We need to ensure that the neighbors are not threatened by export of terrorism, extremism and separatism. And we have consistently underlined that the gains of the last two decades, especially with respect to women and minorities, should not be lost. Terrorism is a global phenomenon whose destructive potential and lethal reach is enhanced by breakneck technological innovations and ever-evolving digital landscape. Terrorists are using internet and social media for terrorist propaganda, radicalization and recruitment of cadre misuse of new payment methods such as blockchain currencies, payment wallets and crowdfunding platforms for terrorism financing. Domestic measures alone cannot deal with terrorism as long as some countries continue to provide safe haven for terrorists. Therefore, to be effective, the fight against terrorism must be long-term, sustained and global. It must tackle not just the perpetrators of the acts but also those who support and sponsor them. And with that, we come to the end of this episode of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savajay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.